Day one at the roar before the 24 hours of Daytona is in the books. We've got a lot to talk about for a day which only featured two practice sessions. But the big news, in my opinion, is GTD Pro. So we'll be talking a lot about that today. So welcome back to Daytona International Speedway. I feel like I just left, or maybe I didn't. I'm wearing the same clothes as I was uh, last time I was here. Maybe I just hid under a bridge for a week. But we are back in the paddock here at the Rolex 24. Unfortunately, had to take a year off uh, while we were still here covering the race, but we weren't down and dirty um, covering this event uh, like we really should have been last year. And now we are, and boy, have I got a lot to talk about. So I guess we'll, what we'll start with first are who was fast and who was slow. There were two sessions run today. Of course, uh, five classes in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Um, and the two classes of note to me are prototype, because of course that's who's gonna be going for the overall win, DPI. Uh, fastest today was the Meyer Shank Racing Acura ARX05. It's only Acura versus Cadillac this year. There is no Mazda, though Chip Ganassi Racing painted their uh, second car to look like a Mazda, I guess. Um, but the big story to me is GTD Am and GTD Pro. And look at this. The GTE Am car is faster. Now, why is that? Well, Sports car racing is run under a rule set known as balance of performance. Each car is taken by IMSA and tried to be made to be as equal as possible. Because, the fa because of the fact that GTD Pro and GTD Am are using the same regulations, which are a basis of the GT3 global regulations, IMSA decided that the cars would be running under the same balance of performance. There would be no difference between the two, um, the two classes in that respect. And what that has done is essentially you've got one class racing that is just divided into pro and am. And I've, I've, we'll get a few drivers on the record throughout this weekend. I've already spoken to a few in GTD um, on the GTD side of things. And it definitely seems like um, there's going to be racing between these two categories. And really, they're going to be all together in a group the entire time. And so I think that's going to be one of the real keys to watching this race is, is that GT battle. Because my question is, how, how hard are those GTD AM cars going to push? How hard are they going to have to push? Because if they are, they are just as fast with a pro driver in them, as they would as a GTD Pro car would be. So it's going to be interesting to see as the race plays out, first of all, which class is further up in the overall standings and which drivers in which category will be willing to risk potentially a class win for an overall position. As silly as that sounds, race car drivers are race car drivers after all. And, you know, you, you see a lot of uh, turn your brain off moments, I guess we'll say. So there's a lot of uh, international uh, entries here. There were last year, in fact, but a stellar 61 car entry list for the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. Certainly it's bolstered by the GTD Pro, the addition of GTD Pro. What a fantastic addition, at least at this point. 13 cars, you see teams like KCMG, um, you see the Lamborghinis, but also LMP2, very heavily influenced by, uh, you know, outside interests uh, outside of the United States. Dragon Speed, of course, while they have a very American driver lineup, or at least a North American driver lineup with Herta, DeFrancesco, and award on the driving duties along with Eric Lux, but you also have United Autosports, which of course is Zach Brown's team. You have two cars, in fact, right behind me from G Drive. They're a Russian team. They're bushwhacking from the World Endurance Championship um, for the Rolex 24. So 
this is truly an international event again, and it's great to see. I'm very happy to see, because you think about it, the first year I came here, 2020, remember the world was normal? But I think the, the grid then was 31 cars. Um, they've, they've essentially doubled that in, in two years. So yeah, full credit to IMSA, they've done a great job. And I think it's gonna be a hectic, chaotic race. I think you're really gonna see a lot of yellow flags um, and especially, one of the drivers said to me, especially if it rains, man, a lot of these guys are going to be in big trouble. Speaking of big trouble, or maybe they're not in big trouble, maybe it's all sandbagging. Uh, there could be sand just flowing from the Corvettes at the end of this weekend and going into next weekend. But at the moment, Corvette was bringing up the rear overall for everybody in two sessions. Um, they improved a little bit in the second session. They were only 58th and 59th overall. Um, so yeah, it, it's weird because either this is the most blatant sandbagging attempt I have ever seen in my life or Corvette's in trouble. We're gonna have to see. Um, it's interesting that the Corvette C8R visually is very, 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 very similar to way it, the way it was in GT3 spec versus GTLM spec. The only major difference I've been able to see with my own eyes are is the tire width. The tire width is obviously smaller and the actual wheel uh, height is smaller. So it's a smaller wheel and less wide. That's the easiest distinction I have. To be honest with you, for, mo for a layman uh, looking at the GTE Pro uh, Corvette, you're gonna essentially be looking uh, at the car you saw at GTLM last year. The only difference is right now it's slow as a dog. And uh, I don't know, man. I wonder how much of it is teething problems and how much of it is BOP. I'll try to find that out tomorrow. I'll try to ask around. Um, everybody's convinced that, that it's it's a sandbagging attempt for BOP. Um, I don't know, man. It, it, Imps is supposed to, you know, Imps is supposed to say, yeah, you're not supposed to do that. That's the whole point of why the Roar has a qualifying race now, right? It's it's supposed to be that you're supposed to push. They're supposed to get a good read on what the BOP is going to be for the Rolex, and you're not supposed to sandbag. So if Corvette is sandbagging, it's blatant. If they're not sandbagging, uh-oh, they might be in trouble. So. That is day one here at the Rolex 24. I hope to have more footage, more driver interviews, more good stuff. Um, there's so many cars here. There's so many stories to tell. Hopefully we can tell some of them. Thank you guys so much for watching. I probably didn't even cover half of it. Don't worry. If we didn't talk about it in this video, let me know down in the comments and we'll talk about it tomorrow. We'll see you in the next video.